Please be seated and let's get started. Hi. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about record playback tools and why everyone wants them and why it's so hard. So it seems that most companies, when they deliver a software, they don't deliver test automation. Only a month after it's, the product has been out there. And everyone wants to be continuous delivery and every bug fix, every new feature, they want to have full automation. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So, so my name is Oren. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Testim.io. Um, and I've been doing a lot of software for the last 20 years and I, in, in different domains and testing has seemed like one of the hardest challenges. Uh, it's not, um, like five years ago I've started doing test automation, uh, tools for test automation and it's, and it's hard. So let's talk about that. So first of all when we start we want to talk about the metrics. How do we decide how to pick a tool? Uh, What's, what's in it for us? And we're going to talk about the metrics and how the recording, it's different between the recording and the playback. We're going to do a, uh, just one minute of CSS so everyone is on the same level. Uh, we're going to talk about custom actions, how do we use, what's, th those are things that I'm really missing. And my claim here is that currently as the way people do record playback, that's, it's impossible to do a good record playback tool. And I'm going to show what needs to be different in, in Selenium as well to have good record playback tools. So we should probably start with the metrics. Um, so the question is, how do people choose software? And it's different. <laughs> Developers uh, choose, they think they choose a uh, feature uh, based on feature. They say, oh, I want to have uh, the software that has all the features that I want. Um, later they say, I want to have it like an easy ramp. I want to get started real quick. And there's, of course, integration, debugging. How do I debug this? And over the years, I've been more and more debug oriented. Uh, as you write software, you, there's a research being done that you write 10 lines of code a day. That, it doesn't make sense, 10 lines of code a day. But it, when you look at it uh, for, an entire, for a few years, the entire project, you spend 90% of the time debugging. So you don't write a lot of code, you rewrite the same code again and again. So debugging for me is the best tool that I can have for uh, producing a better product. Uh, the ramp is, a, is crucial. Um, but when you see, the only, when people did research, they found out that the, how really people choose uh, when they have to click on something and install it. It's funny that the UX is, uh, and the UI is so much more important. There have been research that they had different uh, applications uh, and that the user had to rate them. And those are good and look good, and they got the best score, obviously. And those that suck and did it have bad UI, it sucked. But if you take the, the, those two that had good UI that didn't work well, and those who looked well and had uh, bad application, well, they chose the one with the best, the best UI. They didn't just choose it. They said it was a better app. And that's funny because it wasn't. They, they intentionally created different apps that, uh, that looked well and that didn't work well, but still pe people picked that. So before we go back and, uh, and talk about all the bad things, record playback tools, let's talk, talk about what's good about it. Um, so that's, that's the basic thing that people want. They want to have to write a test just as they do it manually. They want to have it in 30 seconds to have something that does 25% code coverage. That's amazing. Nobody does that. That's like Superman. Um, and um, how do you, can you have so much integration code tested in a few lines? So that's why everyone runs uh, record playback tools, but it's not that easy. So a lot of people tried it. QDP had a few uh, good things. 
Um, Sahi Recorder was great as well. There's the Selenium Builder, Selenium IDE, uh, there's Sikuli and Eggplant. We'll talk about those and the differences. So we'll start with the, the features like everyone wants. So what is record? When you record it, it, you have two options. Record it either for bug tracking, so you know exactly what someone did. When you're a developer, you want to see exactly what happened so you can reproduce the test. So you document it. And either you want to play back, that's an amazing feature. The best feature is, as a developer, I want to have reprodu reproducible tests. I don't want to have screenshots. I want to get a reproducible test so I can see that it fails. I want to fix the bug. Now I want to see a green light, and now I want to chunk it into the continuous integration, so it's going to run again and again. So let's talk with image-based versus object-based. So Selenium is in the object-based, but there's, of course, there's image-based that you look at the pixels, and that's very visual. You know exactly what's being clicked, so that's nice. Uh, object-based doesn't look at a pixel. It looks at the DOM, as you can expect, and looking for some properties. So the image-based, you can see there's a, wow, I know exactly what's going on. That's nice. Um, so there's, there's a few challenges there. What happens when you click on something, an object, that that's it, it's just this checkbox, it's just a small checkbox. I need to get a more global look at the world. So screenshot used to be something heavy, but it's not anymore. For um, at 50K, you can get a screenshot. That's, okay. that's, that's nothing, um, who would have believed? And, but the UI can change. So an object like Selenium, we, we think it's easier, but, but it's not because the same input as well. Um, if we just know that uh, not all of them has text, not all of them has something that we can show the users. I'm showing you the pixels right now so you can understand. If I showed you an input with a checkbox, then you probably would have known. So there's a... So a good way to describe it is the label four. Every input on the spec should have a label four, a label that is attached, but nobody does that. So you get a lot of just input that you don't know exactly what they're related to. Uh, just by, you have to look at the code to understand. So there's things like images um, that, if you're just looking at the object, at the properties, so you can see the source image, but if you don't look at the pixels, how do you know what's going on? What, what is that? I don't know. So it's not that easy to record. You have to combine the two, uh, object-based and image-based. Um, we'll get to use first in a second because that's something very, very easy to show. Um, you can click. You, can, you don't even need to install anything. Just go to a remote browser. You just click on stuff, and you get the images. That's in a second. Um, so before we delve into um, record playback and all the properties you have to save, let's talk about a few seconds about CSS. So I guess everyone knows here CSS, so we'll go, uh, we'll, we'll go real fast. So CSS is, uh, there's XPath and CSS, there's a small difference, um, but most of the developers, they know CSS. So they work for queries that help us find elements so we know what to click on. So we got, we can, all the, all, in, in, it's not just web, it's mobile. Everything is box-based. It means that it has an, like a tag, and usually it has lots of properties. That's it. All the application in all its forms usually the same. So you can always, for example, in CSS, you can find it either by the tag uh, or by uh, a property. That's it. Uh, you get shortcuts. For example, class and IDs have shortcuts because they're often used. And uh, you can nest, you want to check for a specific image that's inside a gallery. So you only select the left one. Um, CSS lets you do that real quickly. Just use the space. There's, of course, there's the end operator. Um, that's nice. You can choose something that has it just, not just an image, which has a specific class or a specific title. And XPath had, it, had it its advantages because it supported text, text content, and it also it supported the parent. That means I want to check, I want to find the gallery, but which has some content in it, some not just the text content, but an inner child. And you couldn't do that with CSS. You you can't though. Actually, there's a spec which is uh, uh, 18 months old, but they didn't implement it yet. So it's it's almost out there. You will soon have it. 
but of course we can do it now uh, using jQuery. So how do you choose properties for record? So this is what this is the spec. This is what we had, like an ID, a class, tag, a locator. So I'll tell you why it's not enough. So playback means you want to find the same element and click it again and again. So this is what we have. So we'll save everything. So I want to show you a few examples of things that you think are trivial for you guys, but a machine can't know it. So for example, I, I took an app and I recorded, um, there's a real example I had in real life. I took it, I, you recorded a play, a simple click, and then when I try to run it again, I go, what? It doesn't work. So you, you try to find out what's, why didn't it work? And you see strange things. Um, there's a, I'll, I'll, most of you that are experienced will probably uh, get them and so you'll see, ah, I had those. So the first one is if I run it again, it, it fails. I knew the ID, I, I just copied it, I run it again and it fails. Well, you have random IDs. There's a, a lot of um, frameworks out there that has random IDs generated. So, okay, so that's off. So what if it's not a random ID? So I know it's not a random ID and I run it and it fails again, what? So it seems, I know that someone changed the code. So I look at it and then I see, ah, damn it, they changed the code again. And that's because when you're doing the testing, usually you're doing it in an aspect-oriented way. You're not involved with the code. The code is from outside and you don't control it and you don't know when it's gonna change. Um, so the third, bug I spotted was the same ID. I run it again, I see the, the element, but I run, when I run in the console, find that element with ID, it says no, it's, it's not there. Uh, somebody has like, any clue any, um, why? It's iframes. Um, you have iframes, and so now you're, you're trying to, okay, but finding an iframe, that specific iframe, is, is not as easy as it seems. It's even harder than finding an element. Well, because even your, the attributes for that iframe, the only attribute, for example, the source, that can change from uh, one deployment to another. There's a lot of cache killers. So even the source, that little string, that the only thing that we have to find that element, um, it changes. So there's a lot of things that we can't do. So, okay, it's not an iframe this time. I'm the same ID and I run it again and I, it gives me not different object, what, what, but I, I give my ID and what does it find, does it define a different object? Well, it's, you have two IDs. You have two, usually with, with reusable component, you have, someone accidentally says, oh, I want to have an ID somewhere, uh, but then you start reusing that component and you have the same ID again and again, so it's like, what? And I, I seldom see this error now, but I used to because there's a lot of Java um, framework out there that did this horrible thing, and I ran it and I find the element, I run it again, and it doesn't work. So now what happens is it had two bodies. The, the framework generated two bodies. So that was like, what? <laughs> so, I, so just looking at the ID and say, <clears throat> us as a, uh, the machine can automatically know what's going on, whether it's uh, from a single run to understand wh whether what just happened and will it be a random ID or not? That's not easy, so they don't know. So my claim is that it's not gonna be easy for other attributes as well. For example, class, we'll use class, that's a, that's a rather reusable component, we'll use class. It's already there, it's like a debugging symbols. But no, uh, they change the styling, they refactor the UI and now they change the style and then change the class and it's broken. And, and what if we have a few elements that it's repeating? And of course, the class here doesn't help. Why will we'll use nth child? No, that sucks. So, and of course, you get usually you you see the recorders and you get this very long non-descriptive uh, selector. You go, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to want to use this. Um, so you can trust me, but 
all other properties are fragile. They're all fragile. So we can't know for a single run to know exactly what went wrong and why this property is stable or not. We can't um, see the future. So there's a few basic things that you can do. Okay, if it's a header or footer, put IDs, and, comp and if it's really important, use class, but that's not enough. So that's why where the design patch, uh, the page object design part is coming to help us out. First of all, it enforces us to have a uh, distinction between the outer component and the inner component. And it's not just about pages, it's about components. So you're adding uh, fragments of, uh, of locators inside where it's supposed to be. So you have a gallery and you have the locator, all the locators that someone wrote uh, next to it. So that's great. There's a, that's an, an hour uh, lecture about page objects. But, so I'm gonna show you now what, uh, what, I, what I claim that has to be done. And my, what I'm saying now, I'm gonna show you something uh, I started building and so, this is the developer tools I'm gonna to start. Um, I guess everyone knows here the developer tools, right? Yeah. So you have everything you need. You have the elements and you have the, that's the HTML and the CSS and the JavaScript, the profiling, everything here. So what we added was um, an extension. So you, you go to Chrome store and you click and you install it, just one click. And then you can start running um, your test uh, from inside your browsers. So the first thing you do, okay, you start doing what you normally did. And what you notice is that, wait a second, someone has been looking after me and spotting what I did. So the next question you wanna ask yourself, hey, that's not gonna run the next time and I'm gonna show you how it's gonna run the next time and next month and next year, even though you change everything here. But most importantly is the different features I'm gonna talk about, which is are not just the locate, uh, how to locate elements. Um, usually it's very hard. You wanna, in software, the first thing that the developer wants is to reuse. How can I reuse all that? And uh, what we did was just, okay, select those elements, so those steps, and click group them and call it login. That's it. It's, you can reuse it again. Uh, in QDP, you had to install a new application just for that, but here you we just, okay, want a new instance of that app? Okay, we got an Aldo again. And you can pass argument parameters as uh, you probably uh, thought you should. So what I'm saying is that most of the time, you won't need code, but of course, who, who doesn't need code? You wanna have custom action, custom validations. So we'll talk about it. Uh, so first of all, I wanna show you why I think this won't break in the, uh, in the near future. So I, I took just, uh, I recorded a click, and what we did differently is, instead of checking for a specific property, what we did was tell the computer to monitor all properties and validate them and see in the next run and the one after it whether they're stable or not. Why should we do it? We're biased as developers as well, but. Let's, do, let's let a computer follow and see whether it's there stable or not. He knows better, so he can track every property that we, we don't have to pick one. It's not find element by ID. This is what's missing in the, in the API, I guess, not just Selenium. You're, you have to, you have one locator by ID, by class, by CSS selected, no, no, no. You have to have, my claim is that you have to have uh, hundreds of different ways to find elements. So we use statistical analysis find that, that element. If 90% of the property says, oh, that's element right there, so it probably is. He knows better because he's seen it run again and again and again and the test pass. So if you know, he knows better. So if he doesn't, you should, oh, I wanna click fix, I wanna say, that's, it's this one. And he's gonna, oh, he's gonna say, okay, you're right. And he's gonna change the weights. So those things right here, of course you can modify it and uh, or add your custom CSS or code, but, but this one little thing helps you, and it's not just that specific element, because uh, I'm an advocate for page object, not, not just because of reuse, it's because it, uh, it helps you distinguish between different layers. There's of course a component inside a component inside a component, and you, 
there's a, always a relationship between those elements. So most of them are not unique. They're unique to some other element, which is probably uh, the, so the, uh, for example, the gallery has a previous, uh, previous image, next image, show full screen, but you can have two images, two galleries in the same page. So the, all those buttons are relative to that gallery. And if you had something that can automatically let you know and knows that something is relevant to uh, another um, element, you know, and it's automatically going to find out how sp stable is that element. And so it's going to help you out. It's going to know exactly at the DOM what's going on. So you know everything that changes in the DOM, you know what's going on. And it uh, keeps updating you automatically. So once you do have those locators, you can add almost everything you want. If you want to have uh, text validation, that's easy. I want to have text validation. So you just have to pick a text element. Because that's easy. After, if I know how to pick an element, I know how to do text validations. If I want to have uh, advanced image validations, again, I usually just have to pick an element. I can use the arrows to go up and down the DOM. That's it. Um, and of course, an accessibility testing and security testing as well. Usually, the hard part is locating the elements. So, but there's more than that. Uh, we have to use code. Everyone has to use, what if you want to make sure all the numbers together, if you sum them up, there's a thousand, it equals to a thousand. You, a computer can't do that, but it, 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 because it's specific your logic for your, your business. Uh, then you probably should have um, custom validation. So um, custom validation means you want to have code. So okay, that's a nice one. Oh, if you have a code editor, that's nice. So the question is, can I use those smart element locators in my code? And the answer is yes. You can add, you can say that um, I want to have uh, an HTML element as a dependency. What that means is I'm going to find an element and then I'm going to say before I want you to run, it means that before you run the code, I want you to have a dependency injection that specific element. You make sure that element, you find it and it's in the visible spot and only then just run the code. So if we have, uh, let's call it search, input, we'll rename it, and then we'll have the code saying, let's uh, set some value. And that's it. Uh, we can, the nice part is we can name it, and then once you name it, it's a reusable component, just like the login. We, reuse, we can reuse it again and again. So why not custom validation, or custom action? We have the search again, we can reuse it. So uh, one example is you can build building blocks out of those. I'll show you an example um, right here. So if I take this very small website and, uh, and I'm going to try now to build uh, a building block for my QA guys, that manual QA, they can reuse the same thing. So I'm going to build a building block. So it's so okay. That means I want to have uh, custom actions. So if you want to use uh, custom action, let's just say build a click. Um, so we'll add custom actions, that's a JavaScript. So we know a click has to have one uh, argument, which is an HTML element. So let's use this. So we choose which one. And let's re rename it, let's call it element. And how do you do a click? That's easy, we have jQuery and we'll do a click. So that's nice. And, and we'll give it a name. My click. So we have a custom component right now uh, that we wrote, which in, uh, hopefully, if there's internet, it's going to do some clicking and it's probably going to open up in a second. Um, so the next, next thing we'll probably want to do, uh, let's see if there's internet. So the next thing we'll probably want to do is add another click. So the nice thing about adding another click is that now you can assign um, I see there's no internet, but, but the nice thing that you can probably do is assign a different element. So now you can have, a, when you have a component which has one dependency, which is element, now you can reuse it again and again. That's, so that's nice. And uh, of course, you, you can start running it and see, but I guess you'll probably fail uh, because we don't have internet. Um, but you can use that again and again. So let's go back. We don't have much time. There's going to be food soon. So, so what we did was 
using statistical analysis to find that element again and again. And, and the nice thing is that you can use crowd wisdom as well, because if one, in one project you find out that the Ember action ID is random generated, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an attribute that keeps changing, you can have a better getting started uh, in a different project because you already know that those attributes have, uh, you should probably give them lower weights. So, so you want to have, you must have, uh, when you're talking about custom actions, validations, you have to have arguments that you can have. You must have arguments like parameters, different actual parameters. You want to have debugging control. That means you want to have, uh, you must have access to the DOM. You want to have some validations according to the DOM. Um, because that, that, that's a nice part when you're running a Chrome extension, you have access to the DOM. I didn't show it, but I should, should probably show you. Wait a second. How do I? Uh, it's not never going to end. But here, the nice part is you can write a debugger. And it's going to work. Why is it going to work? Because um, it's going to work because you're running it inside the browser. It's going to take you to the source and debug it. And it's going to you have a breakpoint. And then you'll have the console at your disposal. So you have everything you need. So that's very important. So you want to have access to the window. You want to have, um, maybe you want to run the code, not in the browser, but in the back end, so you can access the database. That's very important, accessing the database so you can uh, check some values. And the uh, most important thing always is easy debugging, easy debugging. What I'm saying is that if you want to give a developer uh, the best time of his life, it's, it's not just mentioning there's, you have a bug somewhere. It's, it's running a test and you see that it's failing and then giving him a link so he can say, okay, open this and it opens the, the result. He sees exactly what the steps and now we can debug it at a breakpoint. Um, you can add a breakpoint. Let's go show you. It's putting a breakpoint and start running it locally or remotely. So that's what developers want. And, and, and there's, it was good reason. Don't give them just a screenshots. Give them a reproducible test. Take it. This is how it fails. So, Selenium IDE uh, is, it has thousands of downloads. It's more, it has more downloads than Selenium itself. It's amazing. So everyone wants, uh, ever wanted was record playback tools. So, and we know why, but this has, you can see wh what we talked about. It, because it doesn't have the image base, so you don't know exactly what was pressed. Uh, you see a CSS input type submit. It's not, it's not easy finding out as a report, finding out what it did. But it's, uh, so if we start from scratch, it's easy to install with one click. You always have to have like something like an extension. This one's for Firefox, but um, eventually they have for uh, Chrome. And you want to have something that's debuggable, so it's also debuggable. It has, you can extend it. Uh, you can extend the JavaScript. That's the, the bus, the, the lame part. Uh, it has variables, which is very, very important. I didn't show you uh, with the testing everything you can, uh, have variables, and they're not globally. So here, the problem with Selenium IDE is you can always save one locator, because when you save it, you want to have it, it's dedicated to doing an exported code. If you want to export a code, well, code only gets one API, which is give me the best locator that you have. And, you, and as we said, you don't know the, who's the best locator. You have to try them all. Uh, it takes like five milliseconds to try them all. That's so fast. Browser is so fast right now. Even the HTTP requests take like 200 milliseconds sometimes. So f trying all the locators, that's nothing today. Saving the entire location, big data is nothing. In 2K, you can save a test which is so descriptive. So you don't want to have any more uh, one locator because usually it looks like this. Uh, actually, I think I have, even have it running now. Um, you have variables, but they're global. Why, why have globals, global variables? You want to have components, those steps. Each one has their own scope, and they can export var variables, but um, no isolated scope. That's a bummer. I think it's a must. And most importantly, code should be a first class citizen. You should add components, not just by clicking, but JavaScript. 
you, you, you have to have those. Every application, everyone is saying that there's not going to be, you can do everything with just record playback. Is, that's a lie. It's not going to happen. You've been saying that for 30 years. You must have code. And th that's not a way you're, to add code in a single line. Give me a full-fledged editor, something that interacts with uh, the, uh, the other, uh, the entire IDE. Not, not just like that. So, so there's Utrace, uh, as I mentioned. Utrace is, uh, they're doing a great job. Uh, you find out, you can see visually, they added so you can see visually what you clicked on. There's no install, so it's super easy to use. They have JavaScript actions as well, super awesome. So you see that the, the people now are adding more custom actions, JavaScript validations. It's awesome. Of course, it's going to be JavaScript because you, you want to run it in the, uh, in the browser. Now you can run it in the background and get a DB as well. So they don't have any running in the background and database. Um, they support variables as well. All the integration, you have to always have integration tools to the CI and great reports. So you, the, the, the bummer side is that if you don't have any installed for a, a, a local Chrome extension, then you, you can debug. Uh, and for me, that was something very critical. If you can't debug, um, how can I find out what's wrong? Um, I, I didn't like it that it's not a first class citizen, the JavaScript, it's just the JavaScript, that's it. No, but I want to make it a reusable component because this is how we think. This is, uh, if, uh, does anyone know BDD here? Because so like BDD is awesome because what you can do is, uh, I'll share an example. In BDD, um, where was I? Let's just merge those all, let's call it something. And the nice thing about BDD is we can add um, empty, um, we can add more and more, uh, we can re start building those building blocks when they're empty before we even write the application. We can have the entire testing suite ready. So we can add more of those, those building blocks. Let's add there and we'll, we'll give them names. Uh, let's add login. We could have named it before and we'll add another one and we'll do check something. Oh. And that was empty. And we can go inside later on and start adding st stuff inside. So, so those, there shouldn't be a, a difference between either it's JavaScript or being recorded actions. So there's, there was no grouping, there's no reuse, you can't, couldn't pass arguments. These are things that are critical in the software when you're writing software. So that's why people go into uh, program using uh, general purpose programming languages. And I used to tell people for years, you have to use 100% just programming languages, no recorders ever. And those were the reasons. And I think it's changing now. Um, you have to, you have to debug, that's it, that's uh, critical for me. So you have to get good reuse, uh, you have to do that. Uh, by the way, even, even just grouping stuff together, not even for reuse, it's like regions, if someone knows C Sharp, that usually helps a lot, you know exactly what's going on. Um, but more than that, you, you, the debugging, you have to have access to the HTTP request. You want to know exactly. If you had a report saying this test failed, but why? Well, look at it. One of the HTTP requests got a 500 or a 404. Then you'll say, um, could be related, yeah. <laughs> we should probably check that out. And when you're debugging, you want to see all the HTTP requests. You want to see the, con the console. You want to be with inside the code. So, and the next thing, because we have only five minutes, so I'll start asking you guys for questions. But the last thing I want to do is I'm, I'm saying that you have to have integration. It, if you're using something like Selenium ID, when you're, you have to export it to code to add it to your continuous integration system. But then you're losing an, uh, you, the connection because, you, you, because you're adding stuff to the code. But not, that shouldn't be right. If you're using something like Selenium ID, you should have it linked automatically to the continuous integration systems. This is when you write a test, you say, okay, start monitoring right now. Start running this every 30 minutes from some places all over the world. Um, and there's, of course, data-driven. You must have, uh, you, that's the reuse and, and, and arguments, different parameters. That's what data-driven is all about. You have to reuse the same scenario again and again, different environments. 
um, reports, we won't have time, but what I'm hoping that, what Salem will probably add was that UAPIs, not just defined by CSS locators, by having a standard for something that comprises a few elements that can try uh, finding them in a most sophisticated way. And that I, uh, either you don't want to have something proprietary, you want to have a standard. So if you're using a record, recorded tool for some, in some tool, you can export it to other tools as well. So it has to be a standard. And that's the nice thing about Selenium, is it's a standard, that's the best thing. It, well, it doesn't have the best record playback tools. QDP did a much better job, but Selenium had the super advantage uh, of being the standard. And uh, 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 Sahi, anyone know here know Sahi or play with it? It's, uh, yeah, there's a few here. Uh, but the standard, that's what made Selenium amazing. And they, they convinced now, convinced browsers to help out because it's a standard, it's a W3 standard. So guys, thank you very much. And questions? So I know there's, uh, there's lunch right now, so uh, feel free to uh, uh, ask me uh, anytime today and tomorrow I'll be here. So thank you guys. <laughs>